Well, welcome back again to my humble chess academy. It's time for the part you probably all, well, at least all of you that don't have this software, the part that you've all been waiting for. Opening principles. I realize that Josh Waiskins saves the openings for almost last. Not really last, but certainly he's given you a lot of other stuff before he's talked about openings. So there is a reason for it, and I understand his logic. Um, not everybody agrees with his way of teaching, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do most of my talking in the beginning, which is right now, and I'm just going to let Josh do most of the talking. So, um, until we get to the middle part of this, let me see, let me think, uh, I think I'll time it because I promised you that I'll keep everything under an hour. I think my last video was 40 some odd minutes. So it is uh, approximately 20 after the hour right now. So let us start. I hope you enjoy this. This will start you playing the game. Uh, the opening principles, now that you've learned Josh's uh, um, specific technical ways of playing, this will get you to actually sit in front of your friend and make the first move. So without further boring you to death again with my voice, here we go. Now we're prepared to plunge into a deeper layer of chess, strategical thinking. Part of the reason I call chess the black and white jungle is because chess positions can sometimes seem alien and foreboding, with danger lurking in every crevice. Other times the game can feel lush and natural, the moves coming to us like raindrops, steadily falling into our minds as if from nowhere. The key to feeling at ease within the complexities of diverse chess positions is to have an understanding of the operating principles that govern all scenarios. Then the moves can spring out of our intuitions like magic, and chess can become a thrilling artistic experience. In part three of the Academy, we'll discuss critical chess principles that can serve as beacons for long-term strategical thinking in positions that might otherwise seem devoid of logic. After this part of the Academy, you'll have a sense of direction in virtually any chess situation because you'll have an eye for its essential components. Like the tactics we discussed in part two, the strategical ideas we're about to take <coughs> on are the building blocks to the most advanced chess ideas. Soak them in and you'll be on your way. Before discussing opening principles, I need to clarify the importance of the opening in the study of chess. The most common error that chess teachers and players make is to spend the beginning of their chess lives memorizing opening variations with which they think they can win lots of quick games. There is nothing more tempting than learning to win fast, but this is a terrible mistake. If you memorize variations, you may do well in the short run, but over time you'll falter because you're not learning the heart of chess. When I began my study of chess when I was six years old, my first teacher and I spent years studying the endgame. This may sound counterintuitive to some people, because I was working on positions I may never see again, but I promise you, this is the right way to go. By studying each chess piece in isolation, I learned the power of empty space. The chessboard possesses fascinating subtleties which emerge over time, and I learned the essence of the chess pieces because I studied them in positions of reduced complexity. What was important was that I was learning the principles which govern all chess positions, you may have noticed that this is the spirit of this academy. I'm teaching you ideas that are universal to your chess experience. Growing up, I was the highest rated kid in the country from the age of eight on, and all the other top players were always gunning for me. There was one coach in particular who ran the program at the school that was the main rival to Dalton, the school I attended from third to tenth grade. This guy taught his students the openings beyond all else. His students had countless traps memorized, and many of them were prepared specifically for my opening repertoire. Playing against these kids was always dangerous, because the beginning of the game was like walking through a minefield. I often came out of the opening down a pawn or two, but I never lost one national championship game to one of these kids. I might have been in a little trouble off the bat, but as the games progressed, I got stronger, and they got weaker, because I was moving towards my area of comfort, the end game, and they were leaving their memorized openings. During my years, the Dalton team won seven national championships, and I won eight individual national titles while our rival was usually just behind in second or third place. I would argue that it wasn't the kids who held themselves back. They were all astonishingly gifted children, but it was the short-sighted approach of their coach. Perhaps the most important thing about beginning with the end game and chess principles instead of memorization is that this way you enjoy the beauty of chess without being completely focused on winning. 
A key component on the road to mastery is to embrace the journey as opposed to fixating on results. That way you can deal with the inevitable ups and downs of competition without falling apart. The end game is where you should focus the beginnings of your chess education, and I would recommend that soon after completing this course, you turn your attention to my end game lessons, in which I teach the essentials of this rich part of the game. Now, with that understanding, I would be remiss to ignore the openings altogether in this academy, because then you sit down to play your first chess games and have no idea what to do. I expect I then get some angry letters on my website. So what we're going to do is learn some principles of opening play. I'll teach you ideas that can be applied to virtually any situation you run up against, and this way you can feel confident no matter what your opponent throws at you. I want to emphasize that in this academy we are taking our first steps to thinking about chess like a master. We are not learning how to trick a beginner. Now to the principles of opening play. I always begin by moving my king pawn out, <coughs> e4. Let's say your opponent doesn't get to move. This is how you should develop your pieces. Your next move should be d4. Now this is only, of course, if black hasn't made another central pawn move to challenge that square. So now your e pawn and your d pawn control this whole area of the board. This is very important. And also notice how your bishops are wide open. They can slice into the game. Your queen is open. Your knights can come out. Having your pawns on e4 and d4 gives you an excellent central control. Next, I would develop my knight to f3. There's a saying in opening play, knights before bishops. So in many opening positions, you'll have a choice. You can bring out either your knight or your bishop. In those situations, usually you bring out your knight first. So knight f3. Next, you might play bishop c4. This opens up your king to be able to castle to the king's side. Notice all the pieces are moving towards the center of the board. I'm not playing moves like knight h3. I'm playing moves like knight f3, control in the middle. Now I might castle. My king is nice and safe. The f2, g2, and h2 pawns are in front of my king, guarding him. Very, very safe. Now, another important idea is that we don't want to advance our pawns ahead of our king, at least not too far. I often describe this as creating air as if the king can feel a draft. In other words, if I were to push these pawns, say to h4 and g4, my king would get much, much less safe, because pieces could slip in the cracks. So here my king is very safe. I have my knight out, my bishop out. Now I might bring my other knight into the game, knight c3. And now my other bishop could come out, either to e3 or f4. Next, I would bring my queen, and this connects the rooks. This is a saying in development in chess, connect your rooks. If I have all my minor pieces out, and my queen, and I castle, my rooks are connected. They're both ready to jump into the middle of the board, for example, d1 and e1. In general, you want rooks on open lines, so it probably either the e-file or the d-file, or another one will have opened up. You want to put your rook on the open file, so if the b-pawn weren't there, this rook would belong on b1. If the c-pawn weren't there, the rook would belong on c1. You want your rooks on open files. This is the classical developmental scheme, but of course, your opponent gets to move too. I just want you to see the... The fact that I highlighted that last sentence. But of course your opponent gets the move too. <clears throat> now notice how when I developed all my pieces, I never moved one piece twice. This is another principle of opening play. Move each piece once. You don't want to move a piece too many times. For example, I brought my knight to f3, my bishop to c4, my other knight to c3, my bishop to f4. I castled, my queen came to d2. Each piece has moved only once and consequently I've developed all of my pieces. If I had moved my light squared bishop to c4 or to b5 to a4 to b3 and then back to c4 again, then none of my other pieces would have been developed. A lot of people make this mistake. They focus on one piece and move it over and over and over. Don't do that in chess. So let's review the principles we've talked about so far. First we control the center. Moves like e4 and d4. Knights before bishops. You develop your kingside knight out to f3. Usually you'll develop the pieces on the side you want to castle first. Obviously then your king can jump into safety whenever it needs to. Next move, bishop c4. Into the center. You can castle away. King safety. Then you can bring your other pieces into the game, trying not to move one piece too many times. Then you can bring your queen in, into the middle. Now this brings up a really important idea. Don't bring out your queen too early. Some of you probably remember that from the movie, Searching for Bobby Fischer. I used to make that mistake. When I was a little boy, I used to bring out my queen too early. It's very tempting, because she's your most powerful piece, so you want to bring her to the game fast. Let me show you why it's a mistake. Let's say you're playing white. You play e4. 
your opponent plays d5, and you take the pawn. Now, of course, you don't want to play a move like knight f3 there, because then they could take your e4 pawn. There's no room for mechanical thinking in chess. They play d5, and you take it. e takes d5, black responds, queen takes d5. Now, the black queen is coming to the game too fast. Now you want to develop your pieces while attacking the queen. Chase the queen all over the board. Say you play knight c3. The knight comes into the game, and the queen has to move. Let's say queen g5. Now you can bring another piece into the game and chase the queen. Knight f3. So now, white has two minor pieces into the game, and black's queen is running all over the place. Let's say he plays queen h6. Now stick to the principles. You can take control of the center and prepare more development. d4, opening up a discovered attack from the bishop on c1 onto the queen on h6. Let's say black plays queen f6. Now you want to keep the same thing going. You want to bring another minor piece into the game with tempo. Bishop g5. You see how all of white's pieces are coming into the game, and the black queen is just being chased all over the place? After bishop g5, let's say black plays queen f5. Now, what would you do here? Bishop d3. Another strong developmental move, attacking the queen. Black will run away again. Queen g4. Now black's attacking our g2 pawn. He has a threat, but that's not a problem. We can simply castle. Take a look at this position. You wouldn't believe how often something like this occurs. Black's queen has been running all over the place. White's developed both knights, both bishops, a strong pawn in the center, and white castled the king to safety. White has a huge advantage here because he developed with principle, while black brought out the queen too early and moved the same piece too many times. So you can see how black's problems were all based on not following the principles, and all of white's moves, which were very, very good, were based on following the principles. This is how you should think about chess, and this is a great way to approach the opening. So, <clears throat> it's the... Uh... It is a science, but it's it's uh, in other words, he can't tell you what piece to move verbatim. Um, generally speaking, the E and the D pawns are the first ones usually to be moved in, in in openings. But there's also English openings which start with C pawns and whatnot. But the idea is to follow the principles. Uh, Following the principles, I mean, your opponent moves too. That's why I highlighted that that earlier. Um, your opponent's moves are going to make you change your mind. But the crux of the whole thing here is to follow the principles. Okay. Now, you've heard me talk about king safety. One last point. Whenever you have a principle that you want to use, you also want to think about how to prevent your opponent from using those ideas. So you want to develop while preventing your opponent from developing. You want to bring your king to safety while preventing your opponent from castling his king to safety. You want to control the center while preventing your opponent from controlling the center. You want to move each piece of yours once while trying to incite your opponent to move as many pieces of his as many times as possible. This is how it works in chess. So every principle you learn will have more than one side to it. Whose position do you prefer here? I'll let you uh, take a look at this for a little couple few seconds. <clears throat> Pause it if you like. Okay. You ready? I prefer white. Very good. It turns out that white is better, because the weakening <coughs> is quite important. There is no forced win, but white has a lot of factors working to his advantage. Whenever you look at a chess position, the first thing you should do is notice the material differences. Begin with the pawns. Count them. Here you see black has seven pawns and white has six, so black's up a pawn. Then move to queens. Both sides have queens. Rooks. Both sides have two rooks. Bishops. Both sides have one bishop. And knights. Here both sides have two knights. So black's up a pawn. On the other hand, white has much more development, a safer king, and central control. So this position is one of trade-offs, material for time and quality. Time, in this case, meaning development, and quality meaning white's pieces are better placed. Okay. How about this position? It's white's move. Who would you play here, black or white? I'll give you a few seconds. Again, I would play white. And, uh, I mean, uh, I should have told you before, you know, pause this if you like, but uh, I would play white. 
That's right. White is better here. Think about the themes previously discussed. What is white's best move? The relevant theme here is king safety. Okay. <clears throat> it's white to move here. Who do you think is better? Click on white or black. Okay, uh, this time I'm going to give you fair warning. Um, pause this. Think about it. I'm going to let this linger for a few seconds anyway. Okay. By now you should have paused it and thought about it. In fact, I'm going to even do something. This will probably give you a hint, but uh, now which side do you prefer? Okay. I think that's long enough. No, that's not quite it. It would be easy to think of this position as one of trade-offs. White has more pawn development, and black has more piece development. It's important to know how to evaluate such situations. The most important issue here is quality of development. White has complete central domination, and black's knights are stuck on the side of the board, so the development is not so useful. If you focused on central control in your evaluation, then you had your eye on the ball. White is much better. One way to see this is to imagine how easily white can develop all his pieces, while black's game is cramped and difficult to handle. Remember, when okay. developing, we want to begin by establishing at least one pawn in the center, holding our ground. Okay, let's say you begin a chess game, e4, e... It would be easy to okay. think of this position as one of trade-offs. Uh, I, I did that on purpose. It's white to move here. Who do you think is better? Click on white or black. Okay, I had to go back a couple of times. You know, the software is hard to control sometimes. Uh, yeah, I did that on purpose. I wanted you to see how chess master answers your wrong questions um the fact is i went through this uh, a couple of times to make sure i had the right answers but uh i, I try to throw a wrench in once in a while <clears throat> what you see here is and i flipped the board so you could see this in fact i'll do it again um what you see here is is that black obviously moved one of his knights at least several times in order to get over here with this knight he had to move it here then here then oh i don't know here then here then here then i don't know who knows in any case the point is is that this knight moved a half a dozen times before it got there not developing any other pace in white obviously even though the white has extended pawns it's still far off better um i wanted you to see what happens when you when you get the wrong answer i'm not saying that i knew this from the beginning because i didn't i, I had to go through this and i wanted to make sure that i i i'm trying to make a uh, an interesting video here but uh, may, maybe i goofed on it a little bit but in any case i want you to see this and i want you to pause the video a couple times if you have to and things like that but uh let's give it the right answer this time and he's going to say the same thing anyway but i want to give it the right answer this time that's right. It would be easy to think of this position as one of trade-offs. White has more pawn development, and black has more piece development. It's important to know how to evaluate such situations. The most important issue here is quality of development. White has complete central domination, and black's knights are stuck on the side of the board, so the development is not so useful. If you focused on central control in your evaluation, then you had your eye on the ball. White is much better. One way to see this is to imagine how easily white can develop all his pieces, while black's game is cramped and difficult to handle. Remember, when developing, we want to begin by establishing <clears throat> at least one pawn in the center, holding our ground. Okay, let's say you begin a chess game, e4, e5, and your opponent plays queen h5, bringing out the queen too early. It's a bad move that lots of beginners play. How can you develop a minor piece into the center and defend the e5 pawn? Okay. It is black's move. What would you like to do here? Well, he doesn't have the bishop out, and he's not attacking this spot on the queen and the king yet, so what if we did this? No, that's not quite right. Try again. Okay. Or, what if we did this? 
No, that's not quite right. Try again. As you can see, there are several things that you're gonna that's gonna go through your brain that you know, I mean you, you see some moves and, and actually these are these are the ones the two that I just gave you were actually two moves that would be right given another position. I just wanted to show you them and I wanted you to see that in the, in the middle of this um, academy, there are times when you do make those moves and there are times when you don't and you have to wait. In, in other words, timing is everything. You know, there are times to make certain moves and there are times not to. Um, but, uh, okay, so let's let's actually look. For, I actually didn't look at this one yet, so I, I'm just wanted to bring you to the to the idea that that there are many choices so let's figure out what the choices are first of all you can't do this because that'll be putting the king in check right <clears throat> all right so let's look at this again and actually read this how can you develop a minor piece into the center and defend the e pawn well he specifically so obviously I, I i ignored that question he specifically asked you to defend the e pawn Defending the e-pawn. This is the e-pawn, obviously. I, I think uh, by now, if you haven't watched the other videos about the chess notation, this is the e-pawn. The right answer at this position is this knight, because you're defending the e-pawn and you're developing a piece. That was the question he actually asked. I, I wanted to show you this because this is going to come up later. Okay, here it is. Here's the right answer. Good job. Knight c6 developing a minor piece into the middle of the board and defending the e5 pawn. This way you're responding to your opponent's threat and developing. Now let's say white plays bishop c4. What do you like for black now? Okay, now we have a problem. Um, I, I Again, I deliberately showed you the other knight moves before and the other pawn moves before because this was coming up. What he's threatening, what white is threatening here is a checkmate because he's got the bishop and the queen attacking that pawn and there's nothing that the king can do if this queen were to take this so if I were to do this attacking the queen which is what I showed you before I'm going to be in checkmate okay um, in fact I'll, I'll do that on purpose again no, that's not quite right. Try again. Okay. So, what can I do to stop this checkmate? Really, there's only one answer. It's this. And this is the other move that I was playing with before. Good job. A lot of beginners try this opening out. Queen h5, bishop c4, and you see white's threat here? White wants to play queen takes f7, checkmate. This is called a fool's mate. So with black now, you have to defend the mate. The best way is to defend the mate in a manner that will allow you to continue with your development. Here there are a lot of moves. You can play g6, blocking the queen's attack on f7, attacking the queen, and also preparing what's called a fianchetto of the black bishop. This is a fianchetto. The bishop goes to g7. Black can continue then, knight f6 for example, and then castle and kingside. This is a very stable, well-protected king position. If you play g6, Let's say your opponent plays queen f3. Remember, no mechanical thinking. I just showed you you want to play bishop g7 to fianchetto your bishop, but here your opponent is threatening f7 again, so you defend it. Knight f6. The knight is defended by your queen on d8. Your next move will be bishop g7. Now white's queen has moved twice in the opening, and it's exposed on f3. Black has a very good position because white tried to trap it. Your next move will be bishop g7, castle to safety, and black has a great game more development okay so um, I, I, I'm trying to point out something here the, the, you know if, if you're gonna ask what's my next move or what's my best move next <clears throat> and then uh, you make a move and you say well how come that was the best move you know in that video and etc it's because of timing I, I deliberately showed you that because there are times where where a certain move is a great move but if it's the wrong timing that same move can be a bad move 
So that's why I was pointing that out, and I was trying to uh, add to to Josh Waitzkin's uh, academy, and trying to add to the idea of why sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Uh, again, it's not black and white. It's not um, it's not verbatim. You, you have to sort of judge every particular position and whose turn is it for example depends sometimes sometimes the same exact moves can win it or lose a game it depends on whose move it is so I wanted to sort of bring that into into the light you know I wanted to show you that in any case uh, I think I can click next here <clears throat> In this position, you could also defend on f7 by playing queen e7. True, you've developed your queen early in the game, but your queen is much less exposed than your opponent's. Let's say that white were to play a3, a meaningless move in the side of the board, but beginners will play this way. Develop with tempo. What should black play now? You see, now, now it's a whole different story, isn't it? You see, the same move from before, the knight, to f6 before it was a bad move but now it's a good move why because a whole a whole different move has passed and you've you've developed your queen over to here protecting protecting that pawn with the queen so you have a whole other piece there that's going to that's going to eliminate the checkmate threat so now you can threaten white's queen before you couldn't when 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 black's queen when your queen was here you couldn't do this because it would still be checkmate but now that the queen is here you can do this because it's no longer that now white is on the run excellent work knight f6 is the best move neutralizing <clears throat> the knight and attacking the white queen Let's say white plays queen h3. Now black can win a piece. Do you see how? Now you've really got white on the run. I want you to look at this for a minute. Pause the video if you have to. Um, I'm about to move a simple little pawn, threaten white's queen, and gain a bishop at the same time. Do you see it? Discover. Remember the discoveries from a few videos back? Okay. Now, if uh, White doesn't want to lose his queen, his or her queen, they're going to have to move it. So as soon as they move it, you've got their bishop. Totally eliminating the checkmate threat altogether. D5. A discovered attack. The bishop on c8 goes after the queen on h3, and the d5 pawn is attacking the bishop on c4. Good work. So white brought out his queen too early, and black took advantage. Whenever your opponent plays strangely, like white did in this example, you should keep a sharp lookout for his threats while playing according to the principles. Remember, stop your opponent's ideas and continue with yours. Okay, this video is, is um, pushing uh, 10, 20, 30, 5. It's pushing, uh, it's pushing over a half hour, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, hopefully, we're going to get, it's on page 22 of 24. I think we're, we're keeping within, give or take, the limits of the half hour, uh, give or take syndrome. So let's continue this. Take a look at this position. Do you think bishop c5 or knight e7 is better for black? Okay. <clears throat> bishop c5 or knight e7. Well, he's going to tell you this, but I, I want to ask you. I mean, sometimes I'll take the knight and put it over here, attacking this pawn. But he's specifically asking you about knight e7. What does knight e7 do right now? Right now, it'll block your bishop. So, between those two choices, I would say 
bishop c5 is the better of those two moves. I'm still questioning this move, though. Although it does block my queen, I, I still question this. Um, whether or not that's actually better than, than c, the bishop c5. But in any case, given the choice that Josh gave us, this is the better move. Excellent work. It turns out the bishop c5 is best, because it develops and allows for future development. Let's take a look at what would happen with the other move. After knight e7, black is blocked in the bishop on f8, and so the knight will have to move again to keep on bringing out pieces, and this violates the principle of moving a piece only once in the opening. Okay, so the principles we just discussed are all you need to know about the openings. Now let's move on to the real chess. Okay. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm going to go ahead and click the next topic um, to give you the preview of the next video as I did before. I didn't do it every time, but I'm, uh, I did it most of the time. Again, please subscribe. Um, comment. Please tell me what you what you think I'm doing wrong. Tell me that you like my video. That would be great. Um, believe it or not, I actually prefer some, some constructive criticism. Perhaps I can make the videos better for you. Um, either way, I hope you enjoyed this video, and don't forget, keep on playing. Many of our strategic decisions in chess come from the nuances of pawn structure. While the least valuable piece individually, the pawn is arguably the most important element of evaluating chess positions, because structure is what gives dynamic potential to all the other pieces. I'll begin by teaching some of the pros and cons of various pawn formations, and then we'll see how they can be applied to strategic thinking. Okay. Pawn structure is our next topic. So, once again, keep on playing, and I hope you enjoyed this video. See you soon.